Welcome to the latest edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast, brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time at any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. I'm Lance Meadow, he's John Schmelk, and today we're going to dig deeper into the 2023 draft class and focus on first-round pick, number 24 overall, Maryland corner, Deontay Banks. And we are joined by the head coach of the Maryland Terrapins, Michael Loxley. Coach, greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Everything's good, fellas, and uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Absolutely. It's a pleasure having you on. And I want to start with the major storyline coming out of the draft for the Giants. When they took Deontay Banks, everybody said you couldn't have picked a better player fit wise for Wink Marnendale's system, considering he's a press man corner who's more than comfortable being out on an island. You know his skill set so well. Why is he such a great fit for this Giants defense? You know, I think it starts with his size. Um, when you look at the the receivers that, that are really having a lot of success in the NFL. Um, there are a lot of big guys that, that outside on that island, typically tall, long, athletic guys struggle to play on that island. But Deontay is one of those guys that has the length that you like, uh, whether it's the arm length, the height, but he also has the feet and the ability to play like a little guy. And so to me, the, the athleticism, the ability to play man coverage, and I think probably his biggest trait or skill set trait that I've always really been most impressed with is his ability to forget a bad play. Um, as you know, you're going to have balls caught on you. You will get beat as a corner. You have to understand that. But it's the ability to get back up on that horse again and, and, and the next play, understand that you've got to let the last play die or it could affect this next one. And he has an innate ability that even when he does maybe give up a play, it doesn't linger and he doesn't lose confidence, nor does he lose the ability to get right back in front of a guy that has talent and know that he has the ability to run with, stick with, uh, and then the ball skills necessary. You know, Coach, it, it's almost become a trope when a coach or somebody or an analyst says, oh, you know, that guy's got that dog in him. But is, is that the type of thing you're talking about with Deontay, the way he just keeps going and has that natural confidence in himself? Yeah, and, and to me, it's not even just the dog in him. I just know when you're around guys like him uh, that play out there, and, and, you know, I'm an offensive guy, and I've had some great receivers that I know put the fear of God into DBs at times because they read the press clippings, they watch them on tape, and they, they maybe play tentative. I mean, this kid will get in front of anybody, no matter what name is across the front or back of the jersey. And as I've used the analogy, he's just dumb enough to not even really care uh, if he's going up against uh, Odell Beckham or whoever the top guys are in that league. He does not care about names. He doesn't care about their reputation. It's like it's it doesn't he's not worried or faced by who he's going against because he has that much confidence in his ability to, to play out on the island. Coach, speaking of the mental makeup of a player, he misses the bulk of 2021 due to that shoulder injury, limited to just two games, but had a very impressive bounce back campaign in 2022. What were the conversations you had with him while he had to be a spectator for the majority of 2021? And what impressed you the most about his ability to put that injury plague season behind him? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, and it's something that we do around here that I, I can't tell you I invented it, but I think it's the best way to handle and manage, especially at the college level. You know, we're a developmental program. We're a program that's always going to be continuing to find ways to develop the players here at Maryland. And what we did with Deontay is what we do with most of our injured guys. They become pseudo coaches. Like we don't put them on the shelf, injured reserve. They go hang out in the training room and they disappear. Uh, we have them active in practice. We have them with scripts in their hand. We have them coaching and teaching some of the younger players to take some of the coaching off of the position coach. And so I think staying active the way we have our injured guys do, uh, do allows them to continue to grow, maybe not physically because they're not able to do it, but the mental piece of it, you know, just imagine taking a player and making them be a coach for a year and then coming back and him being a player, they have a little better understanding of why it's important to do things a certain way or, why we do it that way, and it gives them a different perspective. And I think that's what uh, that's how Deontay benefited from missing the time he missed uh, during the 21 campaign or the 22 campaign to being able to play the way he played this past year. 
have you seen him develop coach over over his time in Maryland um from from when you guys you know first got there together uh to where he is now in terms of how he worked to improve where he improved the most and 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 kind of where that trajectory is heading in terms of his development as a player yeah you know what his development has been from the day he got here he's been a day one starter pretty much for us um and so it wasn't as if he you know had time to to grow and learn under some of the older players because, you know, he got here at a time where there was a coaching change, a transition, a lot of moving pieces and parts. And from day one, he was a starter for us. I think the biggest area where I've seen him improve the most is just, you know, we talk about being a pro and a lot of guys wait until they're in the NFL until they understand the importance of sleep, hydration, recovery, um, eating the right way nutritionally. Uh, Tay has been one of those guys that embraced that lifestyle very early because of the de- desire he had to want to be the best. And it, it, it's really paid off for him. Um, so the, the biggest area where I saw him really grow is just uh, continuing to do the necessary things to put himself in position from a, a, a physical standpoint to be available to play. Coach, on the topic of physicality, when we talk about corners, maybe one of the facets that's overlooked is their ability to contribute in the run game. And if you watch his highlights, you know, he doesn't shy away from getting down and dirty and maybe aiding the guys up front. What have you seen in terms of specifically the development with respect to that facet of his game? Yeah, I mean, because of his size and because of the way we do things around here, uh, I'm not a big guy believing in cover corners um, because at some ball, some point the ball will spit and you got to be able to have the ability to get it on the ground. And, you know, Deontay's a guy that I think will have some position flexibility. Um, I saw a guy, and I, I, I told, I think, Coach Dable this. You know, I gave him a comp of a guy that I, I had a chance to coach and recruit, uh, Chad Scott, who played a long time in the NFL for the Steelers, had good length, could run, was like a 23rd or 24th pick of the Steelers, that as he continued to progress, he plays nine or ten years as a corner, has the ability to play in the slot. But then also, I think, because of the physicality, will be a guy that maybe even finishes his career as a safety that allows him to play a long, long time because he does have the physical traits of a corner that also has no problem with putting his face in there and getting the ball on the ground. You know, Lance mentioned the, the run game coach. In, in terms of coverage, I know you guys just watching the his tape in preparation for the draft, you guys ran a ton of press man. How much did you use him in off, and, and how does his skill set, you think, translate to the different ways you can use your corners and coverage? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not telling anything you don't already know, but the, the skills necessary for being a good press man guy to mirror is a little different than having your eyes on the quarterback reacting and doing that sort of thing. No, so he's benefited that we've had three coordinators in three, about the three years he's been here. Uh, he came in under John Hook, who's a Lovey Smith guy, who's a Tampa 2 guy. They don't play a lot of press. They play off. They look and got vision into the backfield. So he knows how to play uh, cloud coverage where he's looking and keying the old Tampa 2 stuff. Uh, he played under Brian um, Stewart, who is our D coordinator, spent time in the, the Wade Phillips family of coaching 3-4 defense where he's playing off. We do play some man coverage. We spent the season where we played a bunch of man free because it gave us a chance to stop the run, which we've got to do. So I think he'll be multifaceted and from the standpoint that, you know, when you watch the tape, the highlights show the ability to play man coverage. But he's been developed here uh, over the last three years in multiple coverage schemes, uh, the ability to play off, the ability to see through and have the vision necessary to play uh, complementary coverages. But if you want to ask what the strength is, the strength is to put them on their best guy, let them play cat coverage. You got that cat chase them around, use the fundamentals, and, 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 and play good good man coverage. And, Coach, it seems thanks to that versatility that you just talked about, you were also able to tap into his ability to contribute on special teams. I believe he was the main jammer. He blocked an extra point. And you know from young guys coming into the league, even though they may be first-round picks, they can't necessarily be against perhaps contributing on special teams. What were the conversations you had with him for him to be just as amped up to help in that area as much as he did as a cover corner on defense? Yeah, you know, we don't have to do a lot of selling on that because we've had a lot of success. When you look at the players that have come out of our program, our tight end, Chig, Chig Azima down in uh, Tennessee, who had a great rookie campaign and was on every special teams. And so our guys understand the value of what playing special teams can do for you in terms of the next level. And so, 
he was one of those guys that always embraced it. Um, he's also a return guy. You know, he's a guy, if you go back and study him from high school, he was a running back kid that had great open field vision, was a kick returner for us. Um, I didn't put him back there a bunch, but he got a lot of work at it. So there are some some hidden special teams values because he he is a guy that, you know, once he gets his hands on some balls, he becomes a natural uh, instinct runner that allows him to maybe make plays and so there's no doubt he'd be able to add special teams value right off from day one. We're joined by Maryland head coach Michael Loxley. Coach, one of the toughest things, I think, especially if you're playing, you know, press man and your back to the quarterback, is at the catch point, the corner, avoiding contact with the receiver, playing the ball right and not getting called for defensive pass interference. You see it in the NFL and college level all the time. It's, it's a very tough thing to do. How did how did you guys teach that? Because I know in the NFL there are different techniques. I I know Belichick just says watch the arms when the ball gets there, get your hand in there to knock it away, right? Other guys, coach, you watch the guy's eyes, they light up. You try to turn and locate the ball. So how did you guys coach him up when his back to the quarterback to play that ball at the catch point to prevent those catches from being made? Yeah, you know my background. I've been on the defensive side. I played DB in college about a hundred pounds ago. Um, I coached <laughs> on both sides of the ball. Um, here, here's what I learned, you know, one of the top corners in the league who I had a chance to coach, uh, when I was at Alabama is, is Trayvon Diggs and Trayvon started his career at Alabama as a receiver. Yeah. He was a receiver corner, uh, after a year of playing receiver at Bama, he became a corner. And what you see with a guy like Trey is his ability to play the ball in air. And what I've learned over 30 years of being in this business is the way you teach the DBs to play the ball is you have to become a receiver. The reason they get PIs, the reason they panic when the ball's in the air is they're taught to break it up. Well, we try to teach you to become the receiver. So now when the ball is in the air, if you're playing the ball like a receiver, typically you're going to avoid the necessary contact. And if you do make contact, you're making contact going for the ball. Uh, we did that with JB, uh, Jacorian Bennett, his, his other corner who got drafted uh, by the Raiders where we spent most of last spring, I had him run routes like a receiver. I had him after practice become a receiver. I had him, you know, with our quarterback, run post routes, run corner routes, and get a feel for how to become a receiver when the ball's in the air. And so because of Don Deontay's uh, skill set as an offensive player in high school, I think he has a little more ball skills than the typical guy that has played corner his whole life and all he's been taught is break the ball break the ball up, play the hands, play the eyes. No, turn, locate the ball, and become a receiver is kind of what we tried to teach. Coach, when he recently met with the media, one of the games that came up in the conversation that truly highlighted his versatility and his strong play was the Ohio State game this past season in November when he got matched up with Marvin Harrison Jr. and really did a good job containing him. How much, when you look back, was that Ohio State game really a national statement for him that really helped up his profile? Yeah, maybe that's what you guys look at is the the, the up the profile deal. What I've looked at is the long term uh, ability he's shown that when he's playing man coverage and this league has had a bunch of good receivers. Uh, every day he went against some of the top receivers in our conference with, you know, Rakim Jarrett and Dante Demas prior to his injury and Jacob Copeland. And so the old adage of iron sharpening iron has prepared 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 him for matchups like Marvin Harrison Jr. So. Um, I'd say maybe because of the, the the notoriety that Marvin had or has as one of the top receivers possibly, that that's one of the matchups that we, people look for to see how he competed. But if you turn on the tape, he, he competes like that against whether it's Marvin Harrison or uh, whether it's a, a, someone from the school of Sisters of the Poor. He's going to compete. <laughs> what kind of guy are the Giants getting, Coach? You kind of talked about it in, in your first couple answers, but in terms of off the field, locker room presence, you know, type of guy, how he interacts with the coaches, what kind of insight can you give us to his personality off the field in terms of the the type of guy he is and, and what he'll bring to the locker room and New York City becoming part of the community up here? Yeah, the interesting thing is I've spent the last three days sitting and doing end-of-year evaluations with current players. And one of the things that I've used as a, a, a analogy for our current players is not one time did I have to deal with Deontay Banks in anything off the field, going to class, living the right way, the right kind of lifestyle off the field, leadership in the locker room. I mean, here's a kid that's getting drafted in, in the first round of 24 pick, and he's down in study hall two days ago working on finishing his degree because he's going to graduate 
in the next two weeks here oh, from That's Maryland. great. When nice. most guys trick off their spring semester, have six hours, 12 hours to finish, and they wait, wait, wait until their career's done to finish it. I mean, that's who Deontay is. And so he'll be a great locker room addition. I'll tell you this, for you media people, he's not a great interview. He, you know, He's a man of very few words. Doesn't We've seen that already, Coach. Yeah, yeah, we have seen that. Yep. It yeah, doesn't have the comfort level of wanting to sit and talk about himself. But if you catch him in a locker room, he's the life of the party, the life of the locker room. He's goofy as all get out. And 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 it's a good trait to have because he has been a great teammate here and played a major, major role in the resurgence of what Maryland's been able to do the last couple of years. Yeah, he lets his game do the talking, which is probably a good thing when it comes to the NFL coaches, you can attest to. Speaking of learning more about character and relationships, something that you can attest to from being in the coaching field so long, you coincidentally were on the Alabama staff with Brian Dable in 2017 when you both won a national championship. You alluded to earlier conversations you had. How much does it help that Dable can lean on you when he's trying to get more intel on a player like Deontay Banks and the fact that you already had an established relationship to share intel and help better indicate what the trajectory of a player is going to be on the NFL level? Yeah, I think obviously the big thing is, is people understand that when you come to Maryland to evaluate our players, uh, number one, we give, we give total complete access to every NFL team. We don't have closed practices to NFL teams. I know the giant scouts and all the powers that be that make these decisions had spent quite a bit of time down here in College Park evaluating the prospects we had in this year's draft. Now, the fact that Dave's and I have a, a relationship obviously allows the, the information flow to be truthful and honest because I want to see Brian Dable have success. And the last thing I would want to do is put a player in position that can't come up there to help him reach the goals of winning the Super Bowl. And so um, being in the profession the way I have, I think the reputation of knowing one that if they're in my program, they're most likely going to be good kids. Cause if they're not, they're not going to be around here. And so I think Dave appreciates that, but he also knows that the same system and the way he kind of does things is how I was brought up in this business and, and that the players that come out of Maryland will be smart, tough, and reliable. And, and that's what guys want. If you're going to put the type of money that they're putting into some of these players. All right, Coach, final one for me, and this is kind of more of a, uh, a general thing because you've been at this a while. You're very familiar with college and the NFL. How have you seen the relationship in terms of college players transitioning to the NFL change over the years? Because it seems, especially in terms of the passing games, that the styles have become much more similar over the years. Are you seeing just the NFL adopting more collegiate stuff, or, or do you disagree with that analysis that the transition seems a little bit easier now than it was before because of how the games have become a little bit more similar? Yeah, no, I think definitely the games are on track to becoming very similar. I think some of the rule changes that the NFL has trickle down. But when you look at the way styles of play offensively, defensively, I mean, it's traditionally always been a trickle up, even from yeah. the high school level to us. I mean, playing with tempo, no huddle, fast paced offenses started in high school at the tech in the state of Texas and California. And next thing you know, uh, high school coaches are being hired as college head coaches and that system is being, you know, brought up to speed. And so I definitely think when you look at kind of a lot of the offenses, I mean, we, we I've spent so much time on the phone with people from Philadelphia, from New York, Dave's and I, because of the relationships I've had, I've talked to the Dolphins. Everybody kind of wants to know what things these guys can do or should do. or And so I do think there has been a lot more um, – kind of collaboration between NFL and college coaches, because if you look at the style of quarterbacks, the style of play that these guys are playing in the day of the drop back statue in the backfield where, you know, you just stand back there and throw it 50 times. Those days are, are, are starting to become slim and none. And the athletic quarterback, the guy that has the ability to extend plays with his feet arm um, is kind of becoming the new wave. But as we know, it all always cyclical and that it somehow will eventually turn back, but, as of right now, there's definitely a trickle up philosophy when you look at the styles of offenses and defenses that are being played. Coach, before we let you go, I find it always interesting to get the perspective of a coach who was within the same conference of another player the Giants selected. And coincidentally, you played Minnesota 
three of the last four years, and I'm not trying to pour salt into your wounds in terms of what happened in those individual matchups, but you got a close look, I'm assuming, of John Michael Schmidt. We won one game. Center. We won one game. So There you go. That was, I believe, the 45-44 overtime <laughs> affair, if I believe. So I wanted to make sure we gave you credit for that. All right. But you did get a close look at John Michael Schmitz, and he was the Giants' second-round pick and what he did for that Minnesota run game. Just curious, from the opposing sideline, what you saw out of him as you scouted him. Uh, a, a low center of gravity guy, knowing how Dave's loves to to run the football. He always talks about power and controlling the A and B gaps. And, you know, this guy is one of the best in, in the country at the run game stuff. And, and the way Minnesota ran the ball and the success they've had, a lot of it ran through him and through this guy and his ability. So you're getting, you know, the Big Ten, when you want old linemen, you, you look to the Big Ten and this league has had a lot of really talented old linemen come out of it, and the kids you guys drafted is one of the best that have been in there the last couple of years since I've been back in the league. And the Giants certainly looking forward to not only John Michael Schmitz, but Deontay Banks, 24th overall, first-round pick out of Maryland. He's the head coach of the Terrapins, Michael Loxley. Coach, can't thank you enough. Greatly appreciate the time and the thank inside, you, and best of luck this upcoming season. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, John. Appreciate you guys. This is the latest edition of the Giants Auto Podcast. You can catch it on Giants.com, the mobile app, and your favorite podcast platforms.